Hello, welcome back to the Edge of the Box podcast, a podcast by WhoScored.com. I'm your host, Dan Bardell, joined by Josh from WhoScored, and of course, my hero, Jonathan Wilson. And Josh, we are going to start with the Premier League team of midweek. Yep, unfortunately, a spoiler for, for Manchester United fans, there's no one in there from, from then, even though they won three in a row. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll kickstart it. Uh, it's Neto in goal. He got a clean sheet on debut as Bournemouth responded from a 9-0 defeat to Liverpool with a 0 nil draw with Wolves. Um, into the back four, we've got Nathan Patterson at right back. He did really well against uh, an informed Jack Harrison um, as Everton drew with Leeds. He made eight tackles and eight clearances. John Stones is one of um, five, um, six, sorry, Manchester City players. Uh, he got an assist on top of Man City 6 0 win. Johnny Evans, I thought people went a bit overboard on Manchester United's performance in the first half last night. Uh, they didn't really play that well, I didn't think, but Leicester were just so bad. Um, he, apart from being left in no man's land for the for the goal, he did deal, I think, with Rashford pretty easily. Uh, Cancelo, he obviously scored that peach of a goal against Forest. For someone that's so good technically, it does surprise me that he's only scored two goals from 135 shots in the Premier League in his in his career for Man City. Um, Bernardo Silva is on the right wing, and then we've got Suchek in midfield. A, a good goal for him, I think, because it, it did seem like he was starting to drift a little bit for West Ham. Uh, he scored the equaliser against Tottenham. Uh, Gundogan is the second central midfielder. Then we've got Martinelli completing the midfield. Uh, he's had a great start. He's got three goals in his first five appearances. And then up front, it's both it's Manchester City players. It's Haaland, who scored his second hat-trick in a row. We'll talk a bit more about him later on in the show. And then Julian Alvarez was actually beat Haaland to our Player of the Week award. Um, it was his full debut uh, for City. He scored twice. And I think what what Manchester City fans got to see again was that He's just going to be such a great option for them going forward. I think, especially especially when Manchester City were pressing Forest, he was just relentless. He made three tackles, um, and I'm sure City fans are going to see a lot more of him as the fixtures start to come thick and fast. Yeah, really looking forward to going to Villa Park tomorrow and seeing those Manchester City players in action. That's going to be an absolute thrill for me. Jonathan, anything you tag Umbridge with in that team? No. No, happy with that? Yeah. Happy with that? It's yeah. a good start to the podcast. You don't care about the team, really. And you didn't really care when I said that you were my hero. Either. <laughs> Literally, you, well, your, face, your face did not move one bit when I said that. In the well, you say it every week. It's kind of, you know, it's getting... Every week, I'm just looking for a reaction. And I, just, yeah. I just don't get it. Just don't get any reactions. Really playing hard to get, Jonathan. Let's start then with Manchester United against Arsenal. I've got a question for you, Jonathan, to start with. When this when this was like the fiercest game in the Premier League, do you think that's like the fiercest game ever that Manchester United and Arsenal, when they were both good in for the league at the same time? Do you think that's the fi- the fiercest like set fixture that there's ever been? Um, the era of AK and etc. I mean, it was really good. Was it the fiercest mm. ever? I mean, you think I mean, back to some of those food at each other. Those <laughs> think back to those Sunderland Aston Villa games from the eighteen nineties. <laughs> I don't want to talk about Villa. I don't. don't <laughs> yeah, Villa think, were good in the eighteen nineties. Yeah, I think the team that the Villa team in the eighteen nineties would would do better than the Villa team are doing now. They're all dead. So that tells you everything you <laughs> need to know about Villa. I mean, you know, that, that that rivalry was so intense that, that, that you know. I mean, as I'm sure you're aware, that the mm. the highly controversial nineteen thirteen cup final when when Villa disgracefully won one nil. Um, Sunderland were so outraged that they refused to play in the Community Shield the following year against or Charity Shield uh, against Villa. I asked my dad uh, about it. He, he can't be that old, surely, is he? He's not far off. He's not far <laughs> off. He walks like he's not far off. But uh, yeah, you think of things like Reyes getting kicked all over the place, the, the crashes in the tunnel. So yeah, that, that, that rivalry 20 years ago. And the fact that Ferguson and Wenger genuinely, I mean, yeah, they, they clearly are fine with each other now, but at the time they clearly did hate each other. Um, and Ferguson had a way of getting under Wenger's skin. Uh, the, yeah, I, I know people have tried to sort of pretend that the Conte Tuchel thing is you know, no, no, no. That, that was a flashpoint they were both laughing about five minutes later you know uh, 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 you know, a good bit of hatred is uh, is, is not a bad thing uh, and I think especially when the teams are quite a long way apart geographically so it doesn't sort of have that same potential to sort of spill over into you know, sort of street violence on a Friday night or anything like that yeah, it'll never be the same but like, this, this, I think this will be a good game actually at the weekend, but that, that kind of rivalry will never be the same. Josh, are you old enough to remember that rivalry at its peak? I am old enough, yeah. I'm 28 years old, so yeah, I remember it well. Okay. And they were good times. Good times. Yeah, good times. Successful times for both as well. 
Josh, most money ever spent by Manchester United in a transfer window. What's your assessment of it? I mean, you had them in the in the top four before they'd really signed anyone when we did our preview show, so they must be good in the league now. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I don't know, I've got mixed feelings about it. Um, just with, on Anthony to start with, I think you watch United play and they clearly need someone to strengthen that, that forward line. I think you've got Anthony Alanga, who for all of his hard work, he isn't, a starter for a club that man, like Manchester United or, or shouldn't be for where Manchester United are trying to go. Uh, Rashford and Sancho are still only really showing flashes here and there. I think Sancho's, um, he's settling now, but I think he's pretty, not really had an impact in any of the second halves um, so far this season. And obviously you've got Martial, who's missed four of their opening five games, uh, was for sale at the start of the summer. Uh, and Cristiano Ronaldo, who also, if he had his way, wouldn't be there either. So, Ten Hag needed someone to to help that forward line. And I think it's crucial that Anthony, he knows exactly, he comes in and he knows exactly what Ten Hag will want. But, and I know people say you shouldn't care about the price because it's not your money, but I still think it's important. I still think it's the reputation of the club and it affects how you go about doing your business in the future. And I don't think there's any way in in any life that an Eredivisie player should be worth 100 million euros to make him the second most expensive player for Manchester United, one of the most expensive players in the world of all time. Uh, he only scored eight goals in the league last season. Um, and he has bags of potential, but he's still really inconsistent. But if you're spending 100 million pounds, 100 million euros, sorry, on a player who's twice the, the, as much as Barcelona paid for Rafinha, way more than Man City paid for Erling Haaland, then that sort of, pressure that comes is he should be expected to hit the ground running and he he should ex- we should expect him to take Manchester United from sixth to fourth but will he do that I don't think so because he's, he's still very inconsistent but I think it's important that he's going to he's, he's going to be like a lightning rod I think in the Manchester United forward line I think he's going to bring power pace directness skills fans are going to love him he's going to die for the shirt but f- as much as Man United they've spent way too much on him there but we'll see how he gets on and in the other signings, I guess we've got Ericsson and a free, which is a good signing, I think. Uh, he's the only technician that Manchester United have in, in midfield of all their options. Casemiro, we're still yet to see what's really expected of him, just because, like we said last weekend, they went from wanting Frankie de Jong all summer to then signing Casemiro, who's the complete opposite player. Lissandro Martinez has looked really good. I've, I've actually really enjoyed how Manchester United's back four has sort of gelled so far this season. They just seem to love defending. Uh, which hasn't been the case. The reactions that they've given is sort of given off uh, the Italian national team vibes, celebrating sort of every block, every tackle, every clearance. Um, but yeah, mixed feelings on the on the summer on the, on the summer window because we've not addressed the goalkeeper situation. We don't have a goalkeeper that can pass out from the back, which Ten Hag would obviously prefer. And obviously Ronaldo's still there. And at one point in the season, he's got he's gonna there's gonna be a story that he's not happy. So we're just gonna have to see how Ten Hag deals with that. What about you, Jonathan? I know they have obviously have overspent for Anthony, but you know he's a player that the manager wanted, and I always think you know if you're going to take the time to get in a manager, a specific manager that you want, you you should back him with the players that he wants. So I would say that's a good thing. Well, yeah, I mean, um, all the caveats overprice, but United aren't they good at getting value? You know, that's so. Okay, here's a question for you: since they sold Ronaldo in 2010, 2010, 2009, whenever they sold Ronaldo, 2009. 2009 uh, They've made a profit on only two players, two players they've signed rather than two players they've, they've developed from their, their own academy. So do you know who those two players are? I mean, two players I, in 14 years <laughs> is astonishing. I know one is Dan James. Dan James, very good. Did well to get a profit there. I know, which is really weird that we've managed to get a profit on him. Um, and I don't know who the other one is. Is the other one, uh, this is going to be stupid, I'm going to say. I say lots of things that are stupid. De, 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 de Maria? No, it's Chris Smalling. Chris Morley. <laughs> but, yeah, to, to make a profit on two players in 14 years. I mean, yeah, okay, that figure in isolation, it could just mean that, that you know, you, you you sign players when they're young, they, they, they play for 10 years for you, and by the time they leave, they're, they're, they're old and shot. That That is possible. But realistically, there is going to be some, some players who don't quite work out, or some players who want to leave for whatever reason. To only make a profit on two players... You know, in 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 well over a decade, suggests a tendency to overpay. Suggests a tendency to 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 buy players at the peak of their value. Now, Anthony, I think it is a lot of money. Um, 
I think I think you're, you're quite right to have a, a scepticism about players coming from the Dutch league. Uh, I don't think you can say necessarily that no player coming from the Eredivisie can ever be worth that because you, you know you think of Romario or Ronaldo when they first came through Brazilian Ronaldo, you would quite happily have paid the equivalent of 95 million euros, 100 million euros for them. So it is it is possible, but it, it's a huge risk. But I think what's significant about that signing is it suggests a commitment to Ten Hag. Yeah. If you had any doubts about Ten Hag, or if you weren't going to give him two, three, four years, you're not going to spend um, you know, 160, 170 million on three players coming from the Eredivisie who he knows and he presumably has specifically said, I want him. So, so that, I think, is an encouraging sign for United that they do finally have some kind of longer-term plan. I think the squad now looks, looks way, way better than it did 10 days ago. Uh, I don't think it's anything like a perfect squad. I think Casemiro is is very much, uh, uh, you know, he's filling a hole. He wasn't the the the, the you know the player they, they envisaged at the start of the summer, but he is a necessary signing. So I, I think as a sort of staging post to what the squad should look like in a year or eighteen months, I, you know, I think they're not in a bad place now, whereas they're in a terrible place ten days ago. Ronaldo is. Yeah, remains an issue. I, I think it's not insignificant. The three games of one in a row, he hasn't started. Uh, I think it's also true he's looked absolutely terrible in all three games after he came on, uh, which may be a fitness thing that he's still getting that back after you know not training during the summer or not training with the squad during the summer. Um, but yeah, I, I find it hard to believe that won't create some kind of explosion at some point because uh, I mean, he looks pretty miffed and pretty sort of sulky about it anyway so i'm going to find out soon after him and pierce morgan what's happened the truth and he did well, an interview with pierce morgan he was going to anyway do, do i mean i think we know the truth don't we I mean, what, what what other truth is there other than that he know. wants to go and <laughs> they couldn't find pierce, somebody who wanted him pierce Morgan's from... renowned for telling the truth as well so that should, should, <laughs> should be a good watch yeah i mean look it, it in terms of um, exposing some of the internal politics and dynamic of the club, that, that will be interesting and, and seeing how Ronaldo's going to reconcile himself to to being there at least till January. Um, but yeah, if, if, I, if I were a United fan, I'd be much more comfortable now. I mean, it's obvious three wins and no help, but I, I think it, it's beyond that. I think it's the squad looks much, 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 much more balanced. Um, I mean, I, I actually think, you know, the last two games at United have been pretty, pretty poor. The, Leicester put them under pressure in the second half. And this is a really bad Leicester side. Better Leicester side playing really badly at the minute. Uh, I didn't think they were great uh, against Southampton. So they, they, they've got three wins. One of the games they played pretty well in the other two. They did enough. Yeah. You think of many players, either of you, that have come straight from the Dutch league and hit the ground running immediately. I can think of, I can think of two off the top of my head. Robin and Van Suarez. Suarez. That's one. The uh, did Dan Percy like, come straight from the Dutch league? Yeah, but I don't remember him hitting the ground running imme- immediately. Hmm. I could be wrong on that, but Robin and Nist- Van Nistelrooy were the first two that came, came into my head that, that absolutely yeah. smashed it immediately. There's yeah, not loads, is there? No, but I, th- I do think, I don't think he'll probably start on Sunday. I think it would be great if he did, but just because the fact that he missed a lot of Ajax's training yeah. to try and force this move, I, I doubt he'll he'll start, but he would definitely be an important player going forward. And just on Ronaldo, it's very possible that his first start of the season will be in the Europa League on Thursday, which He'll love just that. seems to he will well, love yeah, that. It will just surely be the start of any sort of trouble. There's no way he's going to be um, content with Europa League starts, which is the competition he was trying to run away from in the summer. Yeah. Anthony reminds me yeah, of you sell like that him. to him. But yeah. I mean, he's physically a bigger, a bigger unit. But yeah. in terms of attacking the idea. But with now, surely you sell the Europa League to him by saying, you know, you you could set the all-time record for goal scoring in the Europa League this season. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you're as good as you think you are, go out and score four or five goals in every game. There must be some kind of record that he can combine his Champions League goals and Europa League goals. I might be able to get him on board with that and just say you become the top European scorer ever. There must be something that Manchester United can do to get some buy in for the Europa. To be fair, if you're him, you just want to play football at this point. You know, if you start on the bench, so if you are playing in the Europa League, then so be it, because at least you're playing football. You know, you You'll probably be quite know, fresh for the World Cup as well. I don't know who's in Manchester United's group. I've had I've had very little attention to the Europa League. I've got absolutely no idea who's in their group. To be honest, I, I, have so to I say, can say Josh is a Manchester United fan, and he's not sure. Look at him; I mean, he's having a little look. 
he's having a little look on his computer there he didn't know even the low level of cricket that I play I have to say the summer away games in, in that division that I don't look forward to playing cricket there so I, I can see why if you're an elder you might not be fancying some of those away trips <laughs> I love how you're comparing your cricket career to Ronaldo playing in playing in the Europa League. <laughs> I, mean, I think in terms of ego, is, uh, <laughs> is that how it is? <laughs> oh dear. Let's look a little bit at Arsenal then. Martin Erdegaard seems to be booking the captaincy trend so far. Uh, Josh, he's, he's actually doing well as the captain of Arsenal and the winning yeah. hands and obviously top of the league. He's a lovely footballer. Yeah, I just think on the Arsenal sort of captain thing, it's quite funny. I just sort of looked into like the previous 10 Arsenal captains before Odegaard um, and I'll just like run through them. So Lacazette was obviously the last one. Uh, he ended up leaving on a free in the summer. Aubameyang before him was axed, stripped as captain. The same for Xhaka as well before him. Koscielny was before Xhaka and he forced his way out. Murta Saka only started 6% of league games after he was named captain. Arteta himself only started 8% of league games after he was named captain. Vermaelen started less than half the league games when he was named captain. Van Persie forced his way out. Fabregas forced his way out. And then Gallas was, was stripped of the captaincy. So there's not it's not been a great run for Arsenal captains. It usually sort of spells bad things for the person that gets it. But Odegaard, yeah, he's just been a, he's just been a great player. And I think even against um, Aston Villa in, mid, in midweek, a couple of the balls that he played through to Jesus were just like were just incredible, and I think initially when he first got the captaincy last season, I thought that was a, it. Sort of took me by surprise a little bit, just mainly because he's so young. And then I thought thought about it more than if you think about his career for someone so young, he's had as much experience as anyone else. Obviously, he had to deal with the pressure of being a wonder kid at the age of 15, 16, 17. Then all those years at Real Madrid, captain of Norway, so like he. He's 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 got so much experience, so it's it's like a no brainer in that in that respect, I guess, for Arsenal. Um, but yeah, such a great player, and for the for the game on Sunday, hopefully his ankle injury isn't too bad. Uh, I sort of get uh, like David Silver sort of Iniesta vibes for him. Sometimes you forget he's there, but he's it's just because he's doing all of the good all of the good things so simply and so well, and making them look so effortlessly that he sort of just like strolls around the pitch and, and does everything perfectly. But yeah, such a good player, such a good player. Yeah, and Arsenal flying, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Arsenal seem to always be one of these sort of culture war clubs where you have to take a position. But t- it's possible for two things to be true. They have played pretty well so far and they have won five out of five. And a couple of those games they've won having yeah, seemed to let the game slip. And I think the, the really encouraging thing for them is that every time they've conceded, they've scored within 10 minutes. So that suggests a a resilience which you wouldn't necessarily associate with Arsenal. At the same time, they haven't really played anybody you wouldn't expect them to beat. So this, I think, is the first real test. So, you know, all this nonsense about should they celebrate, should they not celebrate, are they getting carried away? I mean, celebrate all you want, I don't care. But be aware that five wins against five teams you expect to beat doesn't necessarily mean this is a realistic title challenge. I think we'll have a far better picture of, of where they are after Sunday. Are you nervous for the game, Josh? No, not really. Excited. Give Looking forward one. to um, seeing Manchester United, up, Manchester United, this Manchester United, sorry, up against a team that's very aggressive um, and knows exactly what they're doing, playing very well. I think it'll be a good test for both teams, really. But yeah, excited. Yeah, I've also got a few injuries, Jonathan. Party, Zinchenko is a doubt at the time of recording. Our Nenny's been ruled out for, for a bit as well. They obviously were trying to get Douglas Lewis from the fierce negotiators at Aston Villa Football Club, and they didn't manage to get him. So that midfield area suddenly looks a little bit light with Lukonga starting next to Xhaka. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's clearly an area where they, they are thin. Lukonga, I thought, was perfectly all right midweek, and... and... Um, you know, I mean, maybe, he's playing against probably the worst central midfield in the Premier League at the moment. Yeah. Villa are set up, honestly. That, Don't yeah, even get me started at Villa's central midfield. That, that is true. Um, and, and But, you know, when do young players get their chance if not in these kind of circumstances? So you've got to hope he, he thrives with that. And at least, unlike a lot of Arsenal youngsters in the past, he's coming into a, a successful, confident, stable-ish side. And Jack, has, who's had a very good start this season, playing alongside him rather than the wild jacker that he can be. So, you know, clearly they are concerned about that because otherwise they wouldn't have tried to sign Douglas Luiz. But also they're not that concerned although they'd have tried to sign him or somebody like him a bit earlier. So I, I, I wouldn't be... I know, I mean, 
I wouldn't be too concerned, but it, yeah, it is a potential problem on in 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 the in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, Jacques has reinvented himself, in, popping up in the box a lot. Look, look, certainly a dangerous player going forward. Jacques, I've enjoyed watching him so far this season. Let's get some score predictions then, Josh. No bias. What's your score prediction? Uh, two all. Two all. Very good, Jonathan. One all. One all. And I'm going to go for two one to Arsenal. I think a narrow win for Arsenal away from home. We move on now to the just a minute section and Josh is going to start us off with the Merseyside derby. It's Everton against Liverpool. Everton have now drawn three straight matches, one all after Tuesday's stalemate, stalemate away to Leeds. Frank Lampard's new signings look like they're settling, but they still don't look overly comfortable on the ball or in, in the opposition half. Uh, James Garner's uh, deadline day arrival should help with that. And they also re-signed Idrissa Garner Gay. <laughs> Um, but that's putting a lot of pressure on the likes of Connor Cody and James Tarkovsky, although there are at least two defenders that perform well in those sort of situations. Neil Morpé wasn't elig eligible in midweek, but is expected to lead the line against uh, Liverpool on Saturday, with Damari Gray most likely dropping to the bench. Anthony Gordon didn't end up leaving Everton, which is a boost for Frank Lampard. He's had almost half of Everton shots on target this season and has scored in back-to-back -back games. Uh, Liverpool will, will be without uh, Jordan Henderson on Saturday after he suffered a hamstring injury. That injury prompted them to act in the transfer market and sign Arthur Mello from Juventus on loan. Uh, Darwin Nunez, he's completed a three-match ban and will be available, although Roberto Firmino's hit, hit some form, so he will hope to keep his place in the team. Uh, but Klopp may eye some sort of rotation with the Champions League in mind. Joel Matip is back. Simakas may also rotate into the defence. Uh, and as far as Fabio Carvalho is concerned, he'll hope that his... Uh, recent cameos will earn him a starting a starting place. Uh, Everton is still looking for their first win of the season, but uh, like I said, they have drawn three in a row. They haven't uh, won at home to Liverpool in over a decade, though. Uh, so we're still going to go for Liverpool to win. Uh, we've gone 2-0 to Liverpool, but uh, yeah, another intense game should be expected. What do you make of Arthur Mello, Jonathan? It doesn't feel a very Liverpool signing to me. No, it doesn't, but I think it's just they want an experienced body in there, don't they? Um, yeah. It's a... Yeah, it's a short-term deal to, to get them over an immediate crisis. I mean, I, what I'm interested there is is what's going on with Fabinho. There's clearly been some kind of issue. I know that the, the talk was that that yeah he he had a minor injury. Then there was talk that uh, he's you know he was being punished. You know, not playing the United game. I mean that he he'd been punished for um, failing to, to 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 check the opposition counters. So but there seems to have been some kind of. Issue, I mean, maybe it's just an injury that we're reading too much into, but um, I don't think that I don't think his absence helped them against United. No, Liverpool not quite there at the, at the moment. It's, I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to keep harping everything back to Villa. Do they put as many hopeful crosses into the box as Villa do at the, at the moment when they're when they're chasing the game? It's quite quite strange to watch because you know Darwin Nunes hasn't been there. You know, if you're swinging the crosses in the box to a six foot plus striker, fair enough. But at the moment, it seems a strange tactic. You're going to do Chelsea v West Ham, Jonathan. Do you, do you want my score prediction? Oh, sorry, score prediction? yes, please. Yes, that's a uh, three three one to Liverpool. Three one to Liverpool. It's a good job you're here, Josh. I I went for two now, as I already said. Two now. Come on, Dan. When did you say? When, how did you say it during the thing? Oh, all yeah. over the place. Absolutely all over the place. It is early in the morning, though. I'm going to go for 2 1 to Liverpool. All right, Jonathan, Chelsea v West Ham, the game you were supposed to be at. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think this is. Um, I, th I think it's a really difficult game to call. It's Chelsea have been really unimpressive this season. The away games at Leeds and Southampton, particularly, they were poor. Uh, they, but then they were really good against Tottenham and, and yeah, should have won that game and didn't. West Ham have improved recently. Um, whether beating Villa carries much credit these days, I'm not sure. Nope. Uh, but, but played well against Spurs in that one-one draw. Um, you look at them, you you worry about their signings. That they're very un David Moy signings. They brought in four players from France. Number two, they have brought in from one from Italy, and then the two they have brought in from from um, from English clubs. Uh, Corne, who you know, less than well, the season at Burnley. And Emerson Palmieri, who I think started 20 games for Chelsea. So it's, it's not a sort of British court of the squad. Whether they respond to Moyes' methods, whether he knows how to get the best out of them, that that, that worries me slightly. Kante even off his cheek out. Uh, Reese James is a doubt. Johnson and Agued out. Skamaka is a doubt. Chelsea won at 1 0 last season. And uh, I'm going to say 1 0 again for Chelsea. It's a 1 1 from me, Josh. I went for one as well. Like Jonathan said, it's a bit a, tr a tough game to call because neither side are really there at the moment. No, 
That would be an interesting one at Stamford Bridge. Next up for you, Josh, is Brentford v Leeds. Brentford, the comeback kings. They go behind, but they come back and take something from every game, it feels like, at the moment. Thomas Frank will, ha will have to check on Christian Norgaard ahead of Saturday's game with Leeds after the midfielder missed a one or draw with Palace in midweek. Only a couple of changes are expected for the Bees, with Johan Vissa possibly edging summer signing Mikhail Damsgaard for a place in the team after scoring an equaliser off the bench. Leeds came, also came from behind to draw one or with Everton in midweek there. They were the better side, but sort of lacked any sort of cutting edge in attack. They played most of the game without a striker after Rodrigo dislocated his shoulder and Patrick Bamford was only sent on towards the end. Um, Bamford is expected to start this one, though. Uh, Brentford are winless in the last three since battering Manchester United, while Leeds are winless in two. Again, neither have clicked in recent weeks, uh, so I'm going for another one all draw here. Jonathan? 2-1 uh, to Brentford. 2-1 to Brentford. I will go for... A 2-2. Two -two. I think it was a relatively high-scoring game last season when, when Brentford took on Leeds. I can't remember what the score was. It wasn't the last game of the season. I think like 2-2 two -two then as well. So, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with 2-2. Two -two. Uh, Newcastle v Crystal Palace for you, Jonathan. Yeah, I think these are slightly odd teams to read as well. That I think Newcastle have played well in patches, um, but I also think they'll be slightly disappointed to have only won one of their first five games. Uh, could easily have, have drawn a fourth game at Liverpool midweek. Um, but th those draws, you know, against City, fine, but they were three one up against Brighton. They were they were outplayed, uh, and beating Forest on the opening day really is a, is a game you'd expect them to win. A lot of injury problems at the minute: Shelby out, Wilson out, Kraft out, and some some maximum out. Um, Gimarash and Isaac and Lasella all doubts. Uh, but Palace similarly have played well in patches, but have only had the one win. Um, oh, I wonder who that was against. <laughs> and yeah, and that, that's a win that you sort of, you know, you can write in before before kickoff. Uh, uh, only two draws for them, so they're, they're behind Newcastle in the table. Uh, Newcastle won, won at 1 0 St. James last season. They got a very fortunate 1 1 at Sellers Park, but I think they'll just about have enough despite the injuries. So I'm going to go 2 1 Newcastle mm -hmm. this time round. I'm going to go 2 1 Palace. A bit of Zahar and Eze on, on the break. For me, I think Palace and Zahar is playing really well. That is true. Oh. He's, he's scored Hold on to him every window as well. Season. Every window yeah. he stays. How do they do it? But he's an excellent player. But Wolf Zahar, absolutely love watching him. Sometimes his tantrums annoy me a little bit, but uh, well, he's a fantastic <laughs> footballer. Josh, what are you going for? Uh, one nil to Newcastle. On Zaha, he just never looks like he's enjoying playing football. <laughs> He never looks. No, he does when he scores. He has a big smile yeah. on his face when when he scores. Oh, such a such a good player. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd love any good player down at Villa Park at the moment. Be someone I've always wanted Villa to have. He could, the only person that could have replaced Grealish in terms of ego and style, in my opinion. But that's a story for another day. Next up is you, Josh. You're doing Nottingham Forest against Bournemouth. And before you even get into the just a minute section, Bournemouth have only won one game, and that was against Villa as well. Nottingham Forest naturally went mental on deadline day, signing another three players, possibly with Serge Aurier to come. How so many they signed every... overall now? Tw they're on 21, I think, now. Madness. 21, possibly 22, if Aurier does come through the door. Uh, they lost 6-0 to Man City earlier in the week, but I don't think they should read too much into that. They're not the first, and they won't be the last team to be absolutely smashed by them. Uh Lingard was an unused substitute in that game, so you would expect him to come back into the side this weekend. Uh, it might be too late for some of their deadline day arrivals to start, but they'll probably make the bench. Uh, Emmanuel Dennis and Harry Toffolo are probably another two that should come back into the side. Uh, Bournemouth responded to their 9-0 hammering to Liverpool uh, and the sacking of Scott Parker with a 0-0 draw with Wolves in midweek. Caretaker manager Gary O'Neill may look to reward those that started with another go here. Lloyd Kelly missed the defeat to, to Liverpool and Scott Parker sort of lamented that. He was back against Wolves and uh, was a standout performer for them. So and you already sort of get the sense that he's going to play a massive part in their season. Uh, Bournemouth won home and away at Forest in the Championship last season, uh, but would most likely take a point here just to keep the momentum going. Um, it's a bit of a contrast for the two sides compared, when you compare how their summons have gone. Uh, but yeah, I've gone for a one-all draw, another one-all draw. I'm going to go for 2-0 to Forest, Jonathan. Yeah, 2-0 to Forest. 2-0 to Forest, the football pundit's choice. Uh, Tottenham v Fulham, Jonathan. Yes, I mean, I keep saying this, but I think Spurs are quite an odd start of the season as well. That you know, Three wins, two draws and five games. Yeah, I don't really feel that apart from uh, the second half against Southampton, that if they've played that well, or maybe not the second half, but having gone behind against Southampton, they've played that well. Uh, got away with it against Chelsea. Um, probably was second best at West Ham. Although that's a fixture they, they often struggle in. Um 
I, I'm not not sure what Conte's doing with his squad now that he's got it. The fact that uh, Richardson still hasn't started, so this may be an opportunity for him to start, uh, particularly with Son still not playing particularly well, though he did fail to force the own goal midweek. Fulham had a really good start and it could have been could have been better. They you know they, they seem much more uh physical, much, much tougher than they were last time round. Um could have beaten both Liverpool and Wolves, probably should have beaten Wolves. Uh they have beaten Brentford and Brighton. Uh they even went ahead against Arsenal, they, they were largely outplayed in that game. Uh Harry Wilson and Mena Solomon out for them, Lucas Miller out for Tottenham and Benton Kerr and Romero a doubt and Benton Kerr I think is a big miss, but I still think Tottenham should have enough two one. I'm gonna go three two. To Tottenham in that one, Josh. I've gone for one all again. I just one think, all. like Jonathan said, Tottenham have been really odd, and Fulham have like been way better than I thought they'd be. So yeah, yeah m- maybe they can get something from this. Fulham, Fulham are excellent, and I'm going to mention him everywhere because Jao Paulinho, what a player! He was such a good signing that was. And I'd, obviously, you all saw that I tried to get Fulham involved in our in our team day out. I tried to try mm-hmm. to reach out to them on Twitter, ignored so far, but that won't deter me. I'll be back to try and make that happen at Craven Cottage. We could um, just buy tickets like normal people. It's not what we do here. It's not what we do here, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, so, I can't have you pay. I can't have you paying for it. I'm, a, to go to I'm, the I'm a man of the people. No, I, you know, I, I need to put my hand in my pocket. I'm not having you pay to go to go on a. I tell you what, let's get tickets like normal pay? people, then then you can buy the drinks. Who scored could pay? Couldn't that? That would that would make more sense. <laughs> That yeah, for that. yeah. yeah. <laughs> the grand to Martin. If not Martin would be a good organizer, if nothing else. It'd be a shambles when he got there, but I think he'd take it on. Do you get do you get what I mean? He'd, he'd, yeah. he'd, he'd take on the organizing, but there'd be something wrong when when you got there. But he'd take it on with a plum. He would have forgot all the tickets. He would have just done he'd have just done something. He'd, he'll do something stupid. Say hello to Martin for me, please. So, um right then. Wolves against Southampton is your last one, Josh. New signing Sasha Clyde it should should be unleashed from the start here against Wolves. I think they've looked very impressive up until they hit the penalty box. Uh, and that's sort of been their problem since the start of last season as well. Uh, they've before, not won the season before. <laughs> they've not won in the Premier League and have failed to score in three of their first five league matches, so that sort of tells you everything about their struggles. Um but yeah, hopefully he'll start and sort of provide the goals that they need. Southampton's victory over Chelsea came at a cost. It, uh, they lost uh, Lavia. He seemed to suffer an injury and come off. He should miss out here at least for a couple of weeks. He's been made a really impressive start for Southampton. Aribo is expected to uh, replace him in the side. Uh, Jallo will probably hope to keep his place in the side after he started in midweek. Uh, Musa Gineppo is an option to come into the side if fresh legs are required. Uh, but yeah, Southampton should be pretty, pretty in pretty good moods after coming from behind. Um, but they've actually failed to win any of their last six at Wolves. Um, and if Clyditch can hit the ground running, then I think Wolves are onto a good thing there. And I'm going to back them for the 1 0 win. Yeah, I'll go Wolves 2 0 because I always predict them to lose 1 0. And yeah, I'll go for them to win 2 0 at this point. Jonathan? 1 1. 1 1. And then finally, it's Brighton and Hove Albion v Leicester. The big news who scored favourite? Billy Gilmore getting a permanent move. That's going to cement him as one of the top midfielders in the world, isn't it, Jonathan? <laughs> I, th- I, th- I genuinely think it's a really interesting move for him and yeah, it's I do, a really it's a interesting signing. signing for Brighton I think he sort of suits the way they play that sort of yeah. uh, the very sort of patient intelligent mannered passing and I think he's he's got that and I think his his lack of physicality is is, is, is less of a problem for the way they play than for, for a lot of sides uh, Brighton suffered their first defeat midweek against Fulham but they were pretty unlucky that own goal was uh, you know very little you can do about that um, 10 points for the first five games still represents a very good start uh, Danny Welbeck's been playing extremely well and I expect him to, to come back into the side for, for this game Leicester have been been dreadful um, one point from five games there were signs of improvement in the second half against United and, and, and now that all the issue of, of players wanting to leave uh, can be put behind them for January that, that, that should clear the air a bit but they've only brought in two Alex Smithies and Vout Fess um, and you compare that to people like Schmeichel and Fafana leaving, and then it's clearly a you know a, a lower lower grade of player. Moda and Lalana out for Brighton. Bertrand Ricardo Pereira out for Leicester. Um, Madison, I think, is a slight doubt after last night. Uh, it was two one last season to Brighton. I think two nil this time round. I'll go two nil as well. Actually, yeah, two nil Brighton. Josh, uh, one nil to Brighton. I don't know if um, Rogers sort of saw Scott Parker's way. Of um, besides the owners last night, but he seemed to have a bit of a dig at the owners. Wants so maybe to he's trying to angle angle for a way out. Wants that compensation. 
doesn't it? Yeah. All right, then, let's do it. Aston Villa against Manchester City. Absolutely sick of talking about Villa at the moment. Jonathan, I think I've watched every team in the Premier League play 90 minutes now at one point during the season. I'm yet to watch any team and think Villa are better than them. Um, not even Everton in the game where you beat Everton. I've seen things from Everton where I think at least I can see glimpses of, of, of stuff to cling on to. With Villa, there's just nothing. Yeah, I honestly. mean... I, I think the, the real worry is that this is carrying on a slump from the end of last season. It's three wins and 16 now, and those against Norwich, Burnley and Everton, all of whom were in pretty low moments when when Villa beat them. Tough games. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I mean, I think you, you know far more about this than me, but I, I've never... I was, I, was, I was surprised when Stephen Gerrard had the success with Rangers. I didn't kind of... I didn't see that coming. I sort of... I was sceptical of, of him as a manager just because as a player, he was so much about doing it himself. He didn't seem like um, somebody who was sort of organising patterns and shapes in midfield in a way that, say, Michael Arteta used to when he, uh, in, his, in his Arsenal days. So I was always sort of a Gerard sceptic. I, I think we've seen it with him. We've seen it with, with uh, Frank Lampard as well, that they, they, they have a sort of residual goodwill from their time as England players. And I think people are quite quick to praise them when they get a couple of wins early on. Um, and I think we've seen for both of them, it, it, it becomes pretty tough pretty quickly. Uh, I don't know how much you think the departure of Michael Beale matters. I mean, we weren't great when he was there, in all honesty. He was there for, for two two of those wins in however many it was, two in 11 or two in two in 12. You know, we weren't great then. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, you look at, uh, yeah, you look at that pressing on... Um, Whichever night it was, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday, Wednesday. night, Wednesday, um, and it was it was shambolic. Uh, and I know there's you could argue there's a little bit more heart there on Wednesday, but it still felt very sort of scattergun that it was it was players running without running necessarily in a in a structure. So that that would concern me a lot. And and the problem is when you're playing City, City can destroy you even if you're a very good side playing very well. So it's very hard to see this being anything other than a very comfortable away win. Oh, this could this could be any score. Yeah, ha- I mean, Harlan could score six in the first half in in this game at the moment. Honestly, Josh, you've been impressed by Villa so far. Oh, super impressed. Mm. <laughs> I um, I just like from the outside looking, I just don't get what Villa are trying to be on the pitch. I think on Wednesday, I mean, from, kid... from the inside looking in, I don't get what they're, <laughs> they're trying to be on the pitch either. On Wednesday, you had a team that knew exactly what they were doing, and then on the in the other half, you had a team that had no idea what they were doing. I get, like. I guess Villa was sort of praised, I think, in the first half for the aggression they were showing, but I didn't think it was that impressive, to be honest. They just seemed to be fouling Arsenal a lot of the time. Uh, At least that was a tactic. You know, I'll I'll accept any form of tactics at the moment. At least that was a plan of some sort. But that that Uh, also uh, weirdly seems to be Everton's plan at the minute, is just be aggressive. It's as if, you know, with with both Lampard and Gerrard, when all else fails, they still at least can kind of, you know, Light a candle in players and get them to to kind of get stuck in, but yeah, you know, that's that's not enough anymore. Hmm. I just think as well with um, with Villa, I think Gerard's. I don't know if I misheard what Gerard said after the game, but he came out with this really peculiar line that Villa seems to keep giving the ball back to Arsenal because they don't have the technical level to play that way, um, which seemed was quite striking. I thought if that is what he said. If you think that, why are you asking Villa to play that way? If you don't think they're good enough to, to be able to pass a ball, why why is that the route you're looking to go down? I just think as well that the squad just seems to be so unbalanced as well. You've got Leon Bailey, who's the only natural winger in the squad. Uh, I believe you don't. I think you've let the other the others go in the summer. Yeah, um, the rest are more number tens that play off. Yeah, career. and the only way Bailey can play is if you then play either Wendy or Watkins or Coutinho out on the left, and that just doesn't feel right when you see that set up and it obviously hasn't been uh, obviously isn't working and then you almost said well you didn't almost end up selling him but Douglas Louise all of a sudden seemed to be available uh, on, or attracted interest on the last day of the, of the transfer window um, and he's your main goal threat at the moment just scoring from corner directly from corners and that's um, our only goal threat at the moment yeah. scoring from corners that's how bad he is but yeah I, I just don't I just don't get what Gerrard's trying to do. You're second from bottom in the Premier League. I think this is your worst start um, since 1997. I think it was said on commentary uh, in a Premier League season. But I can't 
lie and say I'm not taking a little bit of pleasure from Gerard's sort of struggles. I, I still can't believe that when you played uh, United last season that he walked out at Old Trafford backwards, sort of just looking at the Stratford end. I, I mean, I think you just just get over yourself. But but yeah, I mean, he had, a, he had an OK record at that point for Villa, and I don't think we've done anything since that backward walk. <laughs> Twenty twenty two has been misery, nothing but misery, and I don't see any discernible tactics, any any game plan. I've seen nothing in 2022 that's made me think, oh, Villa know what they're doing. They're, they're on the right track. I just thought that pre-season might make some kind of difference. But like Jonathan says, it's just ended up being a complete follow-on for, from last season, but actually worse. Villa, Villa are in trouble at the, at the moment. Big, big trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm severely worried. And of course, what you don't want when you're not playing well at all is Manchester City. I think if Gerard loses, I think statistically... Sorry, I say if Gerard loses. I think if Villa lose to Manchester City... I think statistically, he's our worst manager ever in terms of win win rate. I, really? As well as, mm. I think well, so. He, all the players seem well, not all the players, but most of the players seem to have regressed, which is a worry. Um, like Jacob Ramsey doesn't look the same player that he was when he sort of broke into the team under Gerard regularly. John McGinn doesn't seem to be having the same impact. Uh, the injury to uh, Diego Carlos is unfortunate because now. It, it seemed very clear that he was trying to face Tyrone Mings out of the picture. And now he has to sort of rely back to Tyrone Mings, which isn't ideal, I guess, if relationships have sort of soured there. Um, Mings is still Villa's best centre-back. He was, our, he was and, our, probably our best player on, on Wednesday against Arsenal. It, it was, I think it would have ended up being Mings and Carlos. Concerts needs to be taken out of the team for his own good at, at, at the moment. I mean, Villa have made a couple of signings, I guess. On deadline day in Den Donker and Bednarek, but they're hardly signings that make the world sit up and take notice. Although I think they're solid additions, these aren't the kind of signings that, that Villa fans were expecting, I guess. Yeah, and I think on paper, Villa's summer was sort of the summer that clubs would like to have. You get your, apart from obviously the deadline day signings, which I think is quite reactionary to what's happened so far, but yeah. On paper, you had all your business done very early in the, in the summer. I know that's tough for fans when it gets to sort of like the last month of the transfer window and you're watching all of these rivals go out and buy players and you're not doing anything. But that's because you've done all your business already. And in theory, that should give the manager the whole summer to to work with these players and have a better chance of starting the season well. But that's obviously not happened. So, yeah, I can just imagine the sort of the mood around the club for fans is... is Awful at the moment. It's not. It's just. It's just not good. There's nothing there at the moment for Villa fans to, to get excited about at all. But if you're a Manchester City fan, I imagine you're pretty excited by what's going on at, at the moment. There's a very real chance that Harlan could score one, score two hat tricks in this game, and that he could <laughs> score three hat tricks in a row. Josh, he's absolutely frightening. He sort of reminds me of on uh, FIFA when you sort of make up a pro. Oh, he's exactly like just, that. And you just stick his stats up to 99 for everything. <laughs> Like, I think at the start, make him as tall like, as possible and strong as possible, and as fast as possible and as powerful as possible. He he's just he's honestly like something you'd create in like a lab. He's just a freak. Um, he's already like just back on hat tricks. He's already scored as many hat tricks in in the Premier League as the likes of Sadio Mane and Son Heung Min, and he's done that in his first five games. Um, I think at the start of the season, I think there was some there were understandably some sort of questions about his suitability to uh, the way Man City play, particularly in the last few years when they've sort of played without a striker. But he's just everything that that side was missing. He like he just comes alive in the penalty area. He doesn't like the goals that he scored. Have most of them haven't even been that good. But he's just been there, and I think that's the most important part for Man City. They have a guy that if you if the ball's bouncing around in the penalty area, it's going to find its way to Haaland, and he's going to put it in the back of the net. Just watching him play, just his movement is so good. And I think if he, if you if you're as a defender, if you try and get too tight to him he will just bully you for strength. But if you then give him space, he's going to just power past you. I, I just, I, he must be so hard to defend against. Um, but yeah, I just, I, if he, the only reason he can't break the Premier League record for goals is if he is rotated too much or if he does get injured, because I think on current pace, he's going to end up, if he does play the full 38 games, which he's not, but say he, he was on current pace, he's going to score well over 60 goals this season, which sounds stupid, but then if you think it's Erling Haaland, then if he did play 38 games, he would probably score that many goals. I mean, my only hope, Jonathan, is that Pep might give him a rest. That's the only thing, because he said that he wouldn't play him three times in a week. So if he's, if he's a man of his word, Pep, if you are a man of your word, 
you will leave him on the bench on Saturday. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think this is a logical game to rest him for with the Champions League starting next week. Yeah, but yeah, Julian Alvarez was brilliant. Um, yeah, be a midweek brilliant. as well. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, everything you say is true. He gives them options that they haven't previously had. My question still is when they play really good sides, does that change in how they play make them more vulnerable? The fact they went two behind against Palace, the fact that they were 3 1 down against Newcastle, that. And I know this can happen to City early in the season. I know this, this sort of thing's happened before. But that would concern me slightly that the lack of control in midfield and control is what that team's based on when you're playing the ball forward as quickly as he needs it. And if you don't do that, then it's it's like the Champions the, uh, Community Shield where he was sort of... I mean, even in that game, he had you know, two or three very good chances. But um, he becomes slightly disconnected. That would be my slight concern. I, I don't think... Like, obviously, scoring back-to-back hat-tricks is great. Is is bundling in goals against Forest what's going to make a difference for City this season? Well, no, it's not. They they they've been the top scorer in the Premier League the last five seasons. If they do that by scoring ninety goals or hundred goals or hundred and fifty goals, it doesn't really matter. What matters is when they play a Real Madrid or a Liverpool or yeah the the, the sort of teams that have been going out to you, even a Lyon. Do, does he give them a ruthlessness? that they haven't previously had and what is the consequence of that loss of control in midfield. And what I think is really fascinating about this is the pattern has tended to be, historically, you get teams who are very good and very successful domestically who find they're too open in Europe and then they become more cautious. So there's Ferguson's line after that uh, 3-2 defeat at home to to Real Madrid in, in, in the quarterfinal in 2000 where he said... Um, and he, I think he was reflecting on this quite a bit later. Um, he said, you know, I realised that having, if you have 20 chances and the opposition have five, you probably win. If you have five chances and the opposition have none, you can't lose. And I think in knockout football in the Champions League, that is actually the most important thing. And what, the, what City have done seems to be to sacrifice the control to bring in somebody who's going to take more chances. It's going to make them more chaotic. Now, you can argue that that, that that control could make them predictable at times and, and, and made it possible for for opponents to, to, to sort of hold them out, good opponents to hold them at arm's length, and that when games did become chaotic, City always struggled and, and Holland will will allow them to, to, to win games that become chaotic. But that's a pretty major shift from what they've been doing. So maybe it'll work. I don't know. I, I find that fascinating and... I, yeah, I don't. Even if Holland still scores fifty goals in Premier League this season, I just don't think that really matters. That's not why he was bought. They were already scoring loads of goals in the Premier League. Let's have score predictions then. Josh, I'll come to you first. Four-one uh, to Man City. Four-one. You think Villa are going to score? Brave man, Jonathan. Four-nil to City. Four-nil to City. God. Come on, Dan. Go and say it. Go nine. I was going to go. I was going to go four four nil as well, but it just looks like I'm copying you all the time. But five then. Go on. I can't predict Villa to lose. I mean, the reason I'm saying four is because I don't think Holland will start. You still come on. Yeah. Yeah, we're running these ten minutes. I'll (laughs) go for four nil as well. That that was what I was going to go with. So I'll I'll go with it. God. I I think just on Holland again. I think what's quite scary is that, or perfect, sorry for Manchester City, is that he isn't going to the World Cup. So. In December, November, December time, he's going to have six weeks off to plug back into the wall socket that he's a robot that needs to charge from, and then he's going to come out to, in 2023 just on fire. That does us then for this week's Edge of the Box. Thanks to Josh and Jonathan for joining me to chew the fat on the Premier League. Whichever games you're watching at the weekend, I hope you enjoy them. And if you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to the channel with your post notifications on. Only one thing left to say, stay safe. Stay safe.